My name is Michael Pomerantz, and you are in the escape pod. Today, a microscopic dissection of one of the many brilliant scenes in the Coen Brothers 1990 classic, Miller's Crossing. It is time to talk about one of my favorite all-time movies. One of the things that the escape pod is for is taking a microscopic look at something in one of these movies or pieces of music and just slicing the pastrami so thin you can see through it. Fatty, of course, but sliced thin. Anyway, here is my chat about just one small scene in the great 1990 Coen Brothers classic film, Miller's Crossing. In another life, I worked with attorneys who had represented real live mobsters. For better or for worse, that was never my job, but I did get to enjoy a few very memorable dinners with these elite defense attorneys from the Philadelphia Bar, and I got to hear some of their war stories from representing organized crime lieutenants and kingpins during Philadelphia's violent 1980s. At one of these dinners, the discussion turned to mob movies, and there was a lot of love for The Godfather and Goodfellas, of course. But one of these attorneys, Robert Simone, who had himself been disbarred from Pennsylvania state courts, who had himself been prosecuted and convicted and jailed on suspicion that he was a member of Philadelphia's organized crime syndicate, and who kept on representing defendants in Philadelphia federal courts, and had issued the exquisite custom-tailored suits favored by most of the people who were there at that dinner, the Bobby Simone said that his favorite mob movie was Miller's Crossing. Most of the other guys at the table had never even heard of it. Needless to say, this endeared me to Simone in a way that I cannot begin to describe. Me, a young civil litigator, petrified of anything having to do with criminal court, could bond with this giant of the defense bar over one of the greatest movies ever made. Now, Simone has long since passed, but I will never forget that moment, and it made me love one of my favorite films even more. There's a vast amount of scholarship already available about the Coen brothers, and even about this movie in particular. I don't know what any of that stuff says. I do know that my experience of this film is that it is perfectly constructed, an entire universe of script, edits, performances, lighting, wardrobe, music, and camera angle where everything fits perfectly, like a complex decorative watch or an insanely detailed ship in a bottle. There's so much here, but nothing is wasted. All the gags work. The violence is brutally disgusting. The protagonist's opacity, especially to himself, is perfectly fine for the only partially resolved ending that you get. John Turturro's over-the-top whining and pleading for his life is no easier to watch today than it was when the film was first released three decades ago. You could literally have a field day breaking down every scene and describing the details which make it special, but I don't have the energy for that. I do, however, want to delve pretty deeply into one particular scene, and it's not one of these many over-the-top set pieces like Albert Finney's Tommy Gun skills as mob boss Leo, or the aforementioned scene with Torturo pleading, it's actually two scenes with Gabriel Byrne to save his life, or any of the scenes featuring Philadelphia's own John Polito as rival gangster Johnny Casper. Polito, by the way, should have gotten an Oscar for this movie. He absolutely controls every scene he is in with such wit, timing, and his amazing physical presence. Judging from what you can find on YouTube, the scene described above, the scenes described above are more popular than the one that's the subject of my discussion. Yet, when I knew I wanted to write something about Miller's Crossing, the only thing I could think of was this relatively early, short scene between Gabriel Burns, Tom Reagan, the consigliere, and a young Marcia Gay Harden, who is Albert Finney's mob ball, Verna. And by the way, Verna and Tom are also carrying on a relationship behind Leo's back. 
Tom is drunk and he has mounting gambling debts. He's just trying to avoid Leo going to war with Johnny Casper's gang over Verna's brother. Tom wants Verna to stop using Leo to protect her brother. We pick up the action at 21 minutes, 37 seconds into the film. Tom's had a bad meeting with Leo at the club and he goes looking for Verna. This whole sequence is bookmarked with a literal whoosh as the camera pans through the club to the bar when Tom masculinely says, get me a stiff one. And the bartender, who's also Tom's bookie, tells him that Verna is in the ladies' lounge. The music rises as Tom walks away from the bar without paying for his drink, and it sounds a bit like a musical or a period piece jazz orchestra. Then Tom enters the ladies' room. Camera movement and position continue to be essential here. We see through Tom's eyes as he comes in, all ready for his tussle with Verna, all the pretty ladies in pastel rise from the room as this predator invades their space. They regard him with annoyance, but they accept he's the man, he's in charge, and they all head out. There's one shot of Tom walking in with the camera moving at the same rate, keeping a constant distance as Tom advances. The other shot is from Tom's point of view, and you see what he sees. Motion is constant, and it is the exact same speed. Both cameras move at the exact same speed, so the effect is very kinetic. I know you can't see the action on a podcast, but even just hearing the whoosh and then the conversation with the bartender and then the rising music and the bravado as Tom gets into the ladies' room is worth it. So here is the scene up to that point. Tom has reached Verna. The next chapter of this sequence can begin. And Verna is calmly applying makeup. She's seated in front of a large mirror. The camera settles behind Verna's right shoulder with Tom sitting in a chair that is located behind her left shoulder. We see her back from his point of view. We see her front in the mirror and we can see Tom's front also reflected in the mirror. Plus, in this mirror, we see another mirror that's behind both of them. It's a total fun house. Now, it seems complicated when you break it down, but the result is that for the first part of this scene, they can appear right next to each other, even though they're facing the same direction and one is behind the other. Because Tom is a little drunk and he's also a little bit behind Verna, he comes across in this as somewhat out of focus. So they engage in this rat-a-tat dialogue and the pace and the intensity and the emotion starts to go up and Tom is getting more frustrated. So he gets up, moves closer to her and then wants to maximize his physical presence. She is not impressed. Now we're vacillating from a camera over Verna's left shoulder showing her front in the mirror and a camera at approximately the same location but this one aimed up at Tom, who's now looming over her. So drunk Tom is getting more and more frustrated as Verna continues to blow him off while also confirming his suspicions that she's not really that into Leo, she just wants to take care of her bro. But Verna can use Tom's obvious attraction to her as leverage, and he doesn't want to admit that she has that leverage, so she so he puts his hands on her. He yanks her out of the chair. Now this is some old school, hard-boiled Humphrey Bogart type stuff. But while he's basically assaulting her, Tom comes in for a kiss. And despite their having been lovers the night before, Verna hauls off at Tom with a substantial right hook to the jaw. He is thrown back, he stumbles into some kind of rolling makeup cart, he stays on his feet, but he spills parts of the cart. He then takes his whiskey glass and hurls it at Verna's head smashing the mirror as she ducks out of the way. She straightens up, grabs her mink, and calmly walks toward Tom. I suppose you think you've raised hell, she says. Tom drunkenly rotates his body to watch her leave. He's defeated in this encounter. He lost his patience but he still has the style and the audacity to try and claim victory anyway. The camera is now moving again as it was at the beginning of the encounter, following Verna out from a very low angle, putting her butt in the exact center of the frame. As she, and it's 
well silhouetted by her slinky green dress. So as she approaches the door, you could start to hear the party music rising again. And Tom steadies himself. He gets against the chair. The camera pulls away at the same speed it was moving to show Verna's departure. And I guess this is what her butt can see. This is the butt's eye view. And Tom says, sister, when I've raised hell, you'll know it. And then he rubs his chin where she hit him. So what has this scene, why has this scene had such a profound effect on me? Is it my love for strong women? Is it the snappy dialogue that's so close to being a parody without actually going too far? Is it the fact that Verna is Jewish? I don't think I worried too much about who was Jewish in movies back then, but maybe. Well, I think the moving camera is part of the attraction. And the way you have multiple angles following the characters at the same speed. Maybe that's Filmmaking 101. It's a course I didn't take, but it really strikes me with this one. And then the whole thing is over in about three minutes. The Empami Escape Pod is an Empami production and is written, produced, and edited by Michael Pomerantz. Thank you for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time in The Escape Pod.